Whoever has received knowledge and eloquence and speech from God should not be silent or secretive, but demonstrate it willingly. When a great good is widely heard of, then and only then does it bloom. And when that good is praised by many, it has spread its blossoms. The custom among the ancients, as Prisian testifies, was to speak quite obscurely in the books they wrote, so that those who were to come after and study them might gloss the letter and supply its significance from their own wisdom. Philosophers knew this. They understood amongst themselves that the more time they spent, the more subtle their minds would become, and the better they would know how to keep themselves from whatever was to be avoided. He who would guard himself from vice should study and understand and begin a weighty work by which he might keep vice at a distance and free himself from great sorrow. That's why I began to think about composing some good stories and translating from Latin, from Latin to romance. But that was not to bring me fame. Too many others have done it. Then I thought of the lays I'd heard. I did not doubt. Indeed, I knew well that those who first began them and sent them forth composed them in order to preserve adventures they had heard. I have heard many told, and I don't want to neglect or forget them. To put them into word and rhyme, I've often stayed awake. In your honor, noble king, who are so brave and courteous, repository of all joys in whose heart all goodness takes root. I undertook to assemble these lays, to compose and recount them in rhyme. In my heart I thought and determined, sire, that I would present them to you. If it pleases you to receive them, you will give me great joy. I shall be happy forever. Do not think me presumptuous if I dare to present them to you. Now hear how they begin. So, today, I am going to be reviewing the Lays of Marie de France. This is something that I read as part of Ancient's Thon. This particular edition is translated by Robert Hanning and Joan Ferrante. It also has an introduction by them, which was good, and notes after each and every one of the Lays, which was super helpful in helping to kind of digest what I had just read. So Marie de France, we don't know a whole lot about her. Uh, she lived somewhere uh, and wrote these somewhere around 1160 to 1199. Um, she was one of the first major women writers in medieval Europe, and not much else is really known about her, uh, which is a shame because she did a fantastic job with these. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed each and every one of them. Uh, and they ranged in topics to having a, a, one of the lazes about a werewolf. Uh, there's a couple of Arthurian ones, uh, including one of, a very, very short one about Tristan and Isolde. And a lot of them have similar underlying themes, uh, mostly with love as some sort of a central proponent of something that's bringing this together. And you'll find, uh, as you do in a lot of medieval literature, that a lot of repetition is going to occur because they liked the same kind of stuff. Medieval people were very different to us. See, we want everything to be unique. We want it all to be different. We don't want the same recycled stuff over and over again. We want new. We want novelty. We want it bigger, better, longer you know, more epic in scope in nature. We want fresh originality, but not the medieval people. See, they took joy in having the same things told with a slightly different spin or in a slightly different way. And there was a comfort in having a story that you were familiar with, and then it's turned on its head to where it gives you an unexpected twist along the way or might finish in a, a manner that maybe you could see coming but didn't really expect because the the previous version you heard ended with a happily ever after and then this one it's not quite such a happily ever after for the the protagonists in the lay now these lays are all in kind of a poetic form you can see here that you know some of the lines are extremely short they have got every fifth line numbered uh, they do have a few occasional notes along the way, but by and large, there's no annotations, there's no glosses or anything with this, but at the end of each one, it does go into usually multiple pages 
of text just talking about the, uh, the, the lay that you just read and some of the main things that happened throughout it. So that if maybe you missed something, and there were a couple of occasions where it really helped me to, oh, hey, I missed that it mentioned that very quickly in passing. Uh, and so it, it helped to enrich the experience after that. Um, for the most part, the lays themselves are really fast reads, um, ranging from, I be, believe, about 200 lines to the longest one being 1,000-ish uh, in length, uh, 1,000. 184, um, which none of those are really long. Um, and so it was a nice, real easy read to pick up when I wanted something that would move at a quick pace and everything else. Um, the, the stories were all kinds of fun. Um, and it was interesting seeing how you would have one lay in here that would have a love story of a woman who's in a loveless marriage and then she meets this young lover and they find ways to to sneak out together and it ends up to where they find a way to make that happily ever after happen for them and then the very next lay you'll have a very similar set of circumstances you know maybe a, a husband that was jealous so he refused that she could see anybody else but him and she was locked in a tower and so she was able to meet this person secretly and they had affairs and uh, the, the king would find out and then it would end up where the the lover or the woman or both would meet a very untimely end to their life um, and in some of the some of the ways in which these resolved are a little shocking uh, by what we would come to expect uh, there's one in particular where it involves uh, scalding water in a bath uh, that was set up as a trap to finish one off, but it ended up getting him caught in his own trap. Um, you know, there there were spikes on a window to catch a guy that could turn into an eagle or a hawk. It was a hawk, um, and that's how he got in to see his lover. Um, but they're really interesting to see as a kind of a snapshot, not only... Uh, the idea of what they portrayed as being almost, I want to say romantic in a sense, um, not in a negative connotation in any way, shape, or form, because most of them center around love as a central theme in there. But to see the, the twist, the turns, the circumstances that medieval writers and readers would have found interesting and fascinating back then. And you can see a wide variety of that in here. Now, what I read to you at the start was the prologue to this book. And it, from the prologue on, there are so many things that made me think of the Canterbury Tales. Now, this is a much shorter, much easier read than the Canterbury Tales, but it has a lot of similarities in that e there's a lot of little sub-stories throughout, and those sub-stories have a lot of those same kinds of themes, whereas Chaucer goes beyond just the, the love and affairs and women in captivity and finding their lovers or kings that are being jealous. Um, but there's a lot that echoes the Canterbury Tales and other medieval works in here. As I said before, medieval readers and writers love to recycle things. They love to take what had come before them and build upon them. Um, Chaucer does that. A lot of his stories are retellings in the Canterbury Tales or twists on a previous tale that had come down through the pipeline. Stuff that we don't really value as highly today. Although it's coming to become a little more popular with things like The Song of Achilles and Circe by Madeline Miller, um, Ariadne. I can't remember the the author of that, but those are, you know, mythology retellings where uh, they, they take some license and they put their own spin on that particular person's story, which is always really fun uh, because it gives you that degree of comfort. You know somewhat of what you're going to get. And at the very least, um, the one lay that I would recommend to everybody 
to read is probably Landball. Um, and that's a pretty common one. It's, it's Arthurian. So you're going to have that comfort of King Arthur and his knights and all of that present within the story. Um, I believe it was Equiton was really interesting. I'm just double checking here. Um, try, nope, not Equiton. Where's the werewolf one? So there, there's one that had a werewolf. Here he is. Uh, Bisclabret. So Bisclabret, the werewolf. Uh, and I imagine that most of these lays you could find individually, um, probably searching online and be able to read a translation of them. And those are the two that I'd probably recommend as the highest ones. Um, those were two of my favorites. It really threw me off to see werewolf uh, in here. I was like, there, there's no way that this actually is about a werewolf, but but it is. Um, so, <laughs> you know, that long before we, we think of the 1800s authors that kind of popularized uh, some of the horror genres with Frankenstein and Dracula and all of them coming to the forefront. I mean, the, the werewolf had its roots way back when. Um, is really fun and interesting to see. So as a whole, um, I really enjoyed this. I'm getting rambly because I, I just, it's fun. It's breezy. It's a good read. This is one that I'm going to be happy to have on my shelf. That I'm going to be excited to get multiple translations, maybe one with better notes in there uh, throughout the text so that I can reference things and get that enhancement of an experience now that I've read them all. Um, it's going to be one that I'll be happy to pull off and just read a lay every once in a while as kind of a palate cleanser, as a, a mood read when I want something that's going to be quick and easy that I can finish in that one sitting and just move right on after that to something different. Um, so if you haven't read anything Marie de France, and I'm sure a lot of people haven't, uh, highly recommend at least check out a couple of them because they are all excellent in their own way. Um, no matter which one you find, you you have my two thumbs up to go and read it because they, they're all fun in their own unique ways. Uh, this is easily a five-star read for me. Um, probably one of the best books that I've read so far this year. Uh, I can't sing the praises of this enough. Uh, so check out some Marie de France. Check out some of her lays. It's by far um, one of her most popular works that she composed during her lifetime uh, and I think you'll all enjoy them. Uh, so thank you for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe. Stay tuned because this weekend I'm going to have more reviews coming. I've got two vintage sci-fi reviews coming to you after this so sometime this weekend. Stay tuned for that.